Hello, welcome to our webinar. Before we dive into the content, we have some background information on the GoToWebinar tool we are using today. If you have any questions during the webinar, please submit them using the chat feature. We will address as many questions as we can. If we miss your question, we will follow up with you after the webinar. You can also use this chat feature to alert us to any audio problems. We will do our best to correct them. Now I would like to introduce Johanna, Senior ECB Correspondent at MNI. Johanna? Hello, everybody. Um, thank you very much for taking the time to join us today. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the uh, policy outlook for the ECB. Um, first, first talking about the December meeting and the general economic assessment, um, the policy debate before looking at the possible timing of uh, government bond purchases. Um, so if you go to the next slide, um, ECB President Mario Draghi had temporarily raised expectations of further easing measures in December when he said on uh, November 21st that inflation has to be taken back to target without delay. Um, However, a number of board members, including his closest ally, uh, Benoit Curé, thought to dampen such expectations, noting that the central bank will not rush into new decisions. So in terms of concrete policy measures in December, no major moves should be expected. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, you know, does, that does not mean, however, that um, the concerns on the Governing Council over the economic outlook have abated. Quite on the contrary, um, the latest Euro Area Composite PMI showed that the recovery has almost grown to a hold. And um, the, the fall that we saw in November in the new orders component, um, which was the first drop since July 2013, prompted a warning from Draghi that a stronger recovery is unlikely in the coming month. Um, the, shop, the sharp drop in oil prices, which you'll see on the next slide, adds to concern um, on the Governing Council as it is likely to weigh on headline inflation ahead. And as it stands, inflation is already undershooting the just under 2% target significantly and last would be just 0.3% in November. Um, and I think what's interesting is that while traditionally the ECB looked through commodity price inflation development, um, both Draghi and his chief economist Peter Pratt recently suggested that in light of low inflation levels, there's a real risk that low headline inflation and inflation expectations could start feeding on each other and so warrant a response from the central bank. Um, so the central bank remains on high alert. Um, and if you go to the next slide now, um, you'll see they'll use this month's monetary policy meeting uh, to, to look at all remaining policy tools. Um, you might remember that during last month's press conference, President Draghi said that the governing council had tasked ECB staff to prepare further measures, um, and these will now all be put on the table and discussed. Um, and the Governing Council will then seek to develop a sense of who might be willing to support what action, under what conditions, and to address what contingency. And I think it's important to note here that you know, the Governing Council has never actually had a vote to see how many policymakers would support or not support QE. Um, so that's going to be a very, very important um, debate for them. And then armed with an understanding of possible majorities, they will then prepare a roadmap, giving Draghi the opportunity to offer a clearer guidance ahead. Um, the outcome of that could mirror, perhaps, Draghi's famous uh, Amsterdam speech of April 24, when he spelled out which tools the ECB would use to address various contingencies, um, and, and in fact has, has stuck to those ever since. Um, 
In terms of the tools they look at, it's obviously uh, primarily asset purchases. Um, they look at private assets, agency bonds like the EIB, uh, and sovereign bonds, or a mix of three of them to get um, the balance sheet to the one trillion uh, uh, boost. Um, and while traditionally there has been a strong preference for private assets, the rising urgency and the rising level of concern that you, you see on the Governing Council at the moment suggests that they might actually skip intermediate steps and include sovereign bonds already in the next move. Uh, the Vice President, Vito Constancio, certainly suggested as much last week. Um, now, if you go to the next slide, uh, I think what is important in projecting the chances for and the timing of government bond buys the key question is how much of a majority Draghi wants to have on the governing council to go ahead. Um, you know, I asked him this question during last month's press conference, but he carefully avoided answering that question. Um, but I think um, I think it's fair to assume that he will be cautious not to coerce council members into a deal. Um, today if you can expect to win over uh, support tomorrow to get a firmer majority and that's still very very important and in the couple of weeks still there are at least three major events that might still um, you know argue for a decision later on uh, the first being the um, uh, upcoming targeted liquidity operation in December and more broadly giving current measures a little bit more time uh, to unfold their full effect. Second, um, a number of policymakers also might think it opportune to hold off any more concrete signals um, ahead of the December Leaders Summit to keep up the pressure on fiscal authorities um, to force them into reforms and in boosting investment. And the third is um, the European Court of Justice um, Advocates General assessment on the OMT, which comes in January. So, in terms of the communication for tomorrow, I think we'll still likely only see a sort of broader <coughs> New Year resolution of bringing inflation back to target as soon as possible. But for a concrete action plan, like we've seen in Amsterdam, you might still have to wait uh, until the New Year. Having said that, Draghi has surprised in the past. Um, if you go to the next slide now, I think um, in any case, the, the chances of uh, QE, including government bonds, are certainly on the rise um, and more likely than not. And irrespective of, of the rhetoric that we've heard in the last couple of days, um, I think a very good indicator is the five-year, five-year inflation swap rates, you know, which is Draghi's preferred indicator of inflation expectations. Um, and he already raised alarm and concern about expectations becoming unanchored when he spoke at Jackson Hall, Hall in August, uh, on August 22nd. Um, and you've seen that uh, those have just dropped significantly further ever since. Um, you know, on the final slide, just a, a brief comment, you know, should they decide to buy government bonds, um, we can expect them to buy according to the capital key. Um, the Vice President said twice last week that the ECB would go down that route if they chose uh, to embark on QE. Um, but I think that we will have to see some adjustments here. Um, this, if the central bank would strictly uh, adhere to that rule, it would very quickly run into constraints by limited uh, outstanding debt of some member countries, such as Estonia and Luxembourg. So it's not going to be quite as simple, um, and I think they'll, they'll, they would have a broad formula based on, on the capital key, but some adjustments. Um, so for now, I thank you very much for your attention, and we'll hand you over to Vicky, and I'm looking forward to your questions later on. Hi, good morning. 
Um, good morning or good day, everyone, depending upon where you're listening in from. Before I go into possible Euro reaction to Thursday's CB meeting, I, I wanted to give a bit of background about where we've come so far this year. And if we can move on to the next slide. Thank you. The Euro closed 2013 around 137.40, and that's compared to a 2012 close at 132, around 132. Euro sentiment this year was very bearish in January, just as it had been bearish at the start of 2013 and 2012. Or rather, I would say the market was bullish towards the dollar and believed that U.S. outperformance would propel the dollar higher. Market players have been fervent in this view for many years, even though it's not always played out. That is until this year, where dollar bulls finally have had their day in the sun. But it's taken a while for this to happen. At the start of 2014, 10-year U.S. Treasury yields were testing highs around 3%, and that was dragging other global yields higher. U U.S. yields had risen on expectations that the Fed would be raising rates sooner than expected. At 3%, however, the yield pendulum had swung too far, and fixed income positions got squeezed. And soon, U.S. yields began moving lower, which served to underpin the euro. So we saw the euro peak at around 139.70 in mid-March, and then uh, around 139.90, 95 on uh, May 8. The run-up in the euro to nearly 140 and cable to nearly 170 was viewed as the final capitulation of dollar long. And soon after the squeeze occurred, market players once again began looking to enter a dollar long position. Heading into the June ECD meeting, and we can move on to the next slide, the euro was trading around 136. The ECB lowered the minimum refi rate, the marginal lending rate, and more importantly moved the deposit facility 10 basis points to minus 0.10%. This was the first foray into negative territory which had a profound effect on the euro. So after falling to nearly 135 on June 5th, the euro made one more push higher. Again, this was on a squeeze. This was in early July. We ran up to 137, and then thereafter began a descent that ended, at least until today, around 123, sort of 55, 60 in November. Uh, today, we broke below that level and went down to, at least the last time I looked, around 123.20. So from that 2014 peak, just shy of 140, the euro has fallen, fallen about 12%. Now I want to step back a bit and go to the August ECB meeting, where ECB President Draghi was asked over and over again about the euro and clearly used the opportunity to jawbone the pair lower. At the time, he stressed that Euro the U.S. and Eurozone would be on divergent monetary paths for a long period of time. So we saw the euro move from about 134.30 to 131.50 in August. Then in, on September 4, the ECB surprised the market, at least in the timing of another cut, by lowering the refi rate and marginal lending rates, as well as the deposit facility, which is now at minus 20 basis points. The euro this time fell below the psychological 130 mark in response to ECB action and then just kept falling. So even when the ECB did not announce new easing measures, the promise of more to come is needed, especially the prospect of sovereign bond purchases weighed on the euro, taking the pair through the next psychological support at 125. And then we went down to the, at least in November, that was the, the latest lows at around 123.60. So what comes next for the euro? Most traders and analysts remain bearish towards the euro. The majority don't see the ECB announcing QE tomorrow, but do see a high probability that this comes in Q1. The question for the euro is quantitative easing and a trillion ECB bond purchases, and specifically esteemed sovereign bond purchases, already priced into the euro. If the market has overshot, as it does sometimes, have we seen the bottom or close to the bottom for the euro? I've been looking at the end of the year 2015 forecast for the euro, and they range from about 117 down to 110. This is end of the year 2015, just want to make sure. But heading into 2014 to year end, I don't think the market would be surprised to see the euro get down to something close to 120. But there are some things to be concerned about. First, with the yen also expected to weaken, there's been underlying demand for euro yen. This is coming not only from the GPIF flows, 
but also from other global investors who feel that Eurozone investments are undervalued. The November uh, BOA Merrill Lynch fund survey showed that a net 8% of fund managers were overweight EMU stocks in November, and this was up from 4% in October, but down from a net 18% in September. So it's already moving higher to 120, 125, and beyond. The steady demand for Euro Yen may prevent the Euro from moving lower. Also, traders have begun to wonder what happens if U.S. data starts to sputter. U.S. yields have been dragged lower recently by the decline in German bond yields and the decline in the peripherals. I know today we saw Italian bonds move below two per, bond yields move below two percent for the first time ever. But the, the the concern is that what happens if U.S. data starts to not be as solid as we've seen recently. And one bad non-farm payroll number, which we'll see tomorrow, could see U.S. yields moving even lower, which could cause another short squeeze in the euro. Let's move to the next slide. The other thing that people are, are they've been concerned about, and been concerned about for months now, is that latest CFP, is CFPC's positioning data. The latest CFPC data for positions as for November 25th showed that speculative accounts had a net euro short of 165,000 contracts. Now, these spec account holdings are only a small slice of the $5 billion a day FX market, but people look at it, nevertheless, as being indicative of the speculative bias. A contract size over 100,000 contracts is deemed extend extended, but that doesn't mean that the currency pair is due for a turnabout. Nevertheless, when positions stay over 100,000 contracts for many weeks and months, it's not a surprise to see a sizable correction at some point. So net euro shorts have been extended. That is over 100,000 contracts since July 29. For the euro to break decisively below 120, as some people are calling for, it will take a perfect storm of further ECB easing action and a reversal higher in U.S. yield. The longer that this does not come to pass, the more likelihood there is of a more sustained euro rally. Now let's talk about the short term. Up until today, where the euro broke lower, the euro has been stuck in a sort of 123.60 to 126 range since early November. If the ECB does nothing tomorrow, as is expected, there's no reason to think the euro is going to break wildly out of this range until the market sees Friday's non-farm payroll number. Uh, I know we've broken below that 123.60 today, but we need to see where the euro closes today to feel in order to call a, a true breakout. Uh, for the non-farm payrolls, we're looking for uh, our median 235,000, and we're looking for the unemployment rate to slip to 5.7% from 5.8%. But remember that lately, even good U.S. data has not been enough to push the U.S. yields higher. So even the 250,000 reading tomorrow may not be enough to do the trick. Uh, if we do see a close today below 123.60, that was the uh, November lows, this will target a move to the August 10, 2012 low near 122.40, and then the July 24, 2012 low around 120.43. If we do see a squeeze to the top side and we break over those November 19 highs at 126, That'll target a move up to the October 29th highs around 127.70, and then the October 15th highs around 128.86. We can move forward on the slide. I, I wanted to mention before I uh, hand it over to Tim again that um, NMI has various FX-related emails that we send out to our clients, and this is one example. We have an MNI FX technical analysis that goes out every day. That was yes, This is yesterday's. And if we move forward to the next slide. And this is my, uh, my feature that I do each day. It's called MNI's On the Radar. And um, I talk about not just foreign exchange, but also things happening in uh, fixed income and commodities. It's a little bit more big picture. But both of these are available via email. And you'll see some contact information from, um, on if you're interested on how to contact our sales desk uh, to get a trial of these uh, of these two features. Anyway, I'll hand it over to Tim now. Hello, uh, and please let me know. I know the uh, volume is different everywhere, so if I'm uh, not able to be heard, please let me know. 
thanks, Johanna, uh, and thanks, Vicky, as well. Uh, Johanna, for the uh, ECB short-term current expectations, very insightful, and, and Vicky for the technical perspective uh, and fundamental perspective on the euro. Very insightful, and I, uh, I always enjoy your detailed daily entries, must-reads in the AM. So M&I and Eurex are part of the same parent family, Deutsche Borsa, as many as you might know. So we appreciate your tuning in to give us an opportunity to pass along relevant highlights of our new Eurex FX offering and, of course, to uh, gain some insights into the ECB uh, and the Euro. Many of you might already know the makeup of an FX product we have, so I will be brief. There's many reasons we decided to move down this path, offering a new asset class at Eurex. Diversification of our product portfolio is clear. However, the changing regulatory environment is clearly an impetus as well. Uh, the regulatory course towards broadening the use of CCP clearing. And more specifically, the mandate for FX options to be centrally cleared at a CCP in Europe will likely fuel increased trading on lit exchanges for both futures and options. So that's a good thing for everyone, bringing transparency to a previously opaque market via increased use of CCPs. <clears throat> so centrally cleared derivative transactions uh, obviously have a lower risk versus bilateral matrices of credit. And since the current estimates peg exchange listed derivatives only at about 3% of the average turnover in FX, we expect this percentage to move dramatically uh, over the coming years towards exchange traded derivatives. So just to tell you a, a bit about our product, and if anyone wants to follow up afterwards, uh, we'll put our contact information on uh, a slide, and we can happily send you the presentation at the end. So our, our futures are, are not a competitor to existed listed exchange fu traded futures. Our products bring together best practice OTC market conventions with the strength of exchange traded centrally cleared derivatives, transparency, minimize counterparty settlement risk, access to a deep liquidity pool, and uh, especially interesting at an extremely competitive price. So these are OTC conventions, not like traditional futures you might be used to. The quotation term structure, the use of spot as the underlying, since these futures are physically delivered through CLS, and they have a standard unit value of 100,000, uh, basically 10 of them making up a buck, which is uh, common in the cash market. And especially, uh, uh, again, the use of a Eurex as a CCP eliminates a delivery risk. So we're, we've started out with four currencies, Euro, US, Swiss, and British Pound, and six currency pairs that comprise those four currencies. Uh, the product is quoted out to the fifth decimal place, uh, minimum price change of spot 00005, which equals five of the pricing currencies on a 100,000 notional contract size. We have monthly serial expirations out to three years, three serial, three quarterly, four semi-annual, and any open positions at expiration result in physical delivery on a payment-by-payment -payment basis uh, settled through CLS in T plus two days. 2015 and beyond, we do have plans to add additional currencies on the G10 front, yen, Canada, Aussie, Kiwi, possibly some of the Scandies, and also additional currencies on the, uh, the NDF exotic front Asian, Eastern Europe, etc. So the trading hours are currently 8 a.m. to 2200 Central European time with plans to extend these trading hours to cover the gap in the Asian time zone next year. A little bit on the fees. Uh, again, following the theme of standard OTC market convention, this Europe product is priced in dollars. So in summary, roughly a buck fifty uh, a million, which is very competitive, uh, versus the cash market alternates. Uh, regular order book trades for market makers and proprietary traders are 15 cents. For customer agency business, it is 30 cents, and then slightly higher fees for any over-the-counter trades that are given up to the exchange. Uh, just a little bit on the product codes in case anyone's interested in looking at them on uh, your trading systems. And finally, Holiday time's upon us, so everyone always likes presents, eh? Uh, the new FX futures will be included in our trader development program. So this is a very nice incentive. Uh, basically, the number of contracts per trader per month for 12 months will be waived of exchange fees. So in summary, any self-directed proprietary trader that is not black box and has never been registered at, as your ex uh, trader in the past can potentially reach a REAP from 10,000 to 35,000 contracts per month 
for 12 months free of exchange fees. So excellent low risk means to test the waters on the euro currency front. Here's my contact information if you have any questions. And uh, I believe uh, Vicky and Johanna's uh, are on there as well on the other pages. Yeah. So uh, if anyone has any questions, maybe we can take those uh, from the audience here with TCI. Do you have, uh, let's see here. How important to ECB policy is the take up at the upcoming TLTRO? Maybe that's for you, Johanna or Vicky. Yeah, um, uh, Johanna, I'm, I'm happy to take that one. Um, so the ECB has had, this is the second of two major operations. Um, and the first one, the take up was a big disappointment for the ECB. It was only around uh, 82.6 billion. Um, now, going forward, I think the ECB actually doesn't expect to be, expect a significant take up. Um, they've they've really reduced their expectations. Um, so I think, you know, if anything, uh, around 150 um, would be great news for them. But I don't actually think that the, the, the take-up of the TLTRO will necessarily be a decisive factor in the question of QE, yes or no. I think it's more a question of uh, QE sooner rather than later. If you think the ECB wants to boost its balance sheet by a trillion, um, and you look at the uh, liquidity component, um, you would have to have a take up of around 200 billion for the liquidity part to be neutral. Uh, in, because in later this year and early next year, we'll have other operations uh, expiring, which uh, will take out another 275 billion in, in liquidity. So I think it will be good news if the liquidity contribution is going to be neutral, um, but obviously that's not going to be uh, good enough uh, to, to expand the balance sheet. Okay. Great. Thanks for that. Another one. Uh, I think it's actually towards you as well, uh, or Vicky. Are government bond purchases more likely to come in January or March, if not in tomorrow's meeting? Vicky, do you want me to take that, or? Yes, please. Um, I think m most people are now looking at March. Um, and there are a couple of reasons for that. One is, in March, um, the ECB is going to have um, a new star forecast uh, for growth and inflation, including the first forecast for 2000 and 17 inflation, which is sort of, you know, the, the medium-term inflation target. Um, another argument for Marsh would be that, you know, there are a couple of policymakers who really insist that current measures need time to unfold. Um, having said that, you know, I don't, I wouldn't exclude an announcement already in January. I mean, I went through these three points earlier. Um, they'll all be ticked off in January. And I think a lot of will depend on what the governing the council will find out during its debate uh, tonight and tomorrow. Um, you know, if, if Draghi finds that there already is an overwhelming majority for QE um, today, then he might not necessarily wait until March, but uh, take the plunge in January. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, maybe time for one or two more uh, this one looks like it's from, I think this is towards me. Does Eurex offer futures only or are options available? Uh, well, in that case, yes, that was, as I mentioned in my lead in there, that was kind of the impetus for uh, our FX offering. Unfortunately, the options are not yet available for trade via terminals in the U.S., uh, but they are trading. There are market makers quoting, and we actually believe that that's going to be the lead uh, in, in pushing uh, many of the derivatives towards uh, centrally cleared, meaning centrally traded, both futures and options. So options are available. I can pass on some information uh, to my contacts in London who can give more information on that if you'd like. Uh, maybe one more. Uh, how relevant is the European Count of Justice's OMT ruling for the ECB's decision whether or not to do QE? I'll repeat that one again and maybe if you can uh, define who the European Count of Justices are, because I'm not sure. Uh, 
How relevant is the European Count of Justice's OMT ruling for the ECP's decision whether or not to do QE? This is referring to the European Court of Justice, um, which is currently looking at whether um, Draghi's signature uh, policy, the OMT, um, actually violates, uh, violates uh, European treaties. Um, and we are expected to see not a ruling, but a, you know the, the, the initial assessment uh, on January 14. Uh, publicly, the ECB has always underlined that QE and the OMT are two completely separate policies, so that any decision by the court would not um, influence its decision on QE uh, in either way. Um, but I think in practice it's not quite that simple. There are three major concerns about the OMT. Um, one being that it's economic policy, uh, and the other being that it, is, it would be a, a represent a transfer of risk and monetary financing. And while the first one would not apply to quantitative easing, the latter two would. Um, so I think the ECB will look very carefully at the ruling, um, and you know might adjust its program. Uh, slightly if, if necessary, but I think the chances are that the European Court, um, in line with its previous rulings, would not triple the program uh, and only, if at all, ask for, for, for sort of minor tweaks here and there. Okay, great. All right, well, I think uh, that wraps it up. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and can, of course, be sent uh, to anyone that, that requests it. Uh, and we'll also post it online, both at Urex and MNI. So uh, thank you, Johanna. Thank you, Vicky. And we will uh, see what happens this week. Good luck to everyone.